Hello everyone, I'm Jim Sen Lee for SpeedEndurance.com and today's presentation is on the 800 meter training program. Now originally this presentation was for the quarter miler moving up to the 800 but the material and content is good for anybody who wants to run and train the 800. Now before I begin, a quick little blurb on the blog. It has about 1,400 articles in the areas of training, injury prevention, nutrition, and recovery methods. So take a quick look if this is your first time. Now let's talk about considerations for moving up to the 800. Now there's about eight factors that I look at before I even think about having an athlete move up to 800. One is to look at your current 400 meter time and your desired 800 meter time. Now it's possible that you're always coming in fourth and fifth in the open 400 and if you move up to 800 you might find yourself coming in first or second depending on your local area and your age group. So that's the first consideration to look at. Uh, the other thing is the age of the athlete. Now most often I see aging athletes move up to 800 because we all know speed training is harder and harder as we get older. So by doing slower speeds, by doing more mileage, you can actually lengthen the career of an athlete for 800. The other important factor is the training age of the athlete. That is, how many years of serious training does he or she have under his or her belt? Uh, are we talking about eight years of training? And by moving up to 800, you may add another three, four more years? Or are you looking at an athlete who just started training and is not doing too well in the 400, and that's when you consider moving him up? Uh, another one, very important, is the uh, physical attributes of the athlete. Uh, most likely the taller, skinnier athletes are the ones who move up. Uh, I think Martin Rooney of the UK is a good example. He's a fantastic quarter miler, but I think his best distance is the 800 based on his genetics. Um, the current coaching situation your teammates and your support group is also another important factor to consider. You want to make sure you have someone there when your legs are tired and you don't want to show up for practice. It's a lot easier to show up when you know you have people waiting for you. Uh, another factor I look at is the desire for aerobic work. Now the 800 requires a lot of running, morning runs, long runs, and not as much as a marathoner but enough that if you don't like it, the 800 meter training is really going to suck. But the last and most important thing I look at when I move someone up is the mental toughness of the athlete. Because we've all seen this, at 500 meters or with 300 to go, everyone starts kicking for home. And it's like the last 100 in a 400. It's going to hurt, they're all kicking for home, and you better be ready for it. So. All those considerations is what I, I look at when I consider someone to run the 800 meters. Okay, let's bring out the calculators. Now this is a topic of debate. The best way to run an 800 is to run an 800 and see your time. But if you want to get an idea of what you know the athlete can run if you move them up, uh, is there's like five different calculators and I'll, I'll just go quickly through them. The first one is the four seconds per lap rule. Take your 400 meter time, add four seconds per lap and that's your time. Some people say five seconds per lap. It all depends on how fast the 400 is. Uh, I know for elite athletes I use a standard of the 10 second rule which is double plus 10 total uh, not per lap and Canada's Gary Reed is a great example with his PRs of 45.45 in the open 400 
and 143.93 for the 800. So that's the 10 second rule doubled. And now I've seen people use the double plus 12 method and ironically the IAAF uses the double plus 14 second conversion because if you look at their B standards it's exactly double plus 14 seconds. So either way there's so many ways to figure the potential of the athlete. Now here's a quick snapshot of what elite 800 meter runners can run in the 4 and 8 and I put this up uh, not to depress the hell out of you but just to show you that a lot of these guys can run you know 44 high 45 mid even low 46 for the open 400 and it's not uncommon to see these runners run in the 4x4 relay at the end of the competition and again Gary Reed of Canada has a 45.45 in that slide okay let's talk about the split differential that is the difference in time between the first and second 400 now there's a sweet spot on how to run the perfect 800 and in this case we can see that the sweet spot lies somewhere around 2.9 to about say 3.5 seconds or say 3 seconds there's really no straight answer but the point I'm making here is that uh, there is a slowdown of about say 3 seconds from the first and second lap and the next slide will show what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is it's all about speed reserve and I put the last two slides together side by side just to show you the difference of their PRs of the open 400 and their split time for the first lap of the 400 and second lap and it's pretty clear that these guys are running say 45, 46 for their open and there's about you know three four seconds slower for the first four so the faster your four the less the first lap will hurt in the 800 and it's a pretty good comparison it's all about speed reserve and you really have to get your speed down to really do well in the 800 now you need your speed endurance you need your aerobic capacity that that's fine but uh, you cannot neglect speed in the 800. There is an exception, of course, to the rule, and the best exception is Dave Waddle at the 1972 Munich Olympics. He ran literally even splits the whole way. He ran 26 point for every 200 meter segment for the entire race. Now at the bell lap, or at the first lap, he was way behind by several meters and I thought I, I saw this on TV and I said my god what's he doing there he's not gonna he's not gonna do well and then again it looks like he was speeding up to catch the athletes but that's not the case everyone else was slowing down he just ran even splits now this is probably the only case where I've seen where you can actually run an even split or a negative split where you're first lap uh, is much different in your second lap but I had to just point this out because this race is still etched in my memory okay now we're getting to the meat of the presentation and you may want to rewatch this later or take notes or pause and take notes uh, it gets pretty in-depth and there's a lot of material uh, when it comes to training for the 800 I, I typically use about seven or eight different kinds of workouts and the first three are pure track sessions now we like to do multi-pace training and I believe that to run the 800 you have to run speeds that are faster than race pace you need to run the race pace speeds and you need over distance work which is 
what I call the 1500 meter or mile uh, type of workouts. And by combining these three different speeds, you really get the um, athlete accustomed to the surging, the slowing down, the speeding up uh, that goes on in a real 800 meter race. And as I mentioned earlier, you cannot beat speed. So the faster you can run um, by going at a bit slower, it'll be much easier for you because of your speed reserve. Um, those are the first three. Now the over distance mile workouts, uh, those can be done on a dirt trail or a wood chip trail, uh, like repeat thousands or repeat miles, but, uh, but this is the, the meat of the training program. Now of course you have to do a lot of aerobic work on top of it and the balance some say 50-50, some say 60-40, but you really do have to get out there and run some cardiovascular and there's the what they call steady state or tempo or VO2 max runs and these are done about one or two times per week. Uh, you have the easy recovery runs which I find are really helpful the morning after of the workout when you're really feeling tired and you just want to flush it out and we're talking about you know 20 minutes maybe half an hour maximum preferably on a soft grass on a golf course uh, try to avoid the pavement as much as possible and heaven forbid don't go on the track and run you know four miles on a track on lane one or lane eight uh, you also need a long run uh, once a week and that's usually on the weekend when you have time, when things are pretty quiet. And we cannot forget the strength and weight training components of 800. Now you may look at half milers and you say, oh, they're pretty skinny, but you know, trust me, they're doing weight training. And one of the reasons is to check for imbalances. If you have someone with constant groin problems or, or hamstring issues, or their lower back is bothering them by doing strength training you will find out pretty quickly what the imbalances are because you'll you'll suck in the weight room at those weights and you have them corrected by your strength and conditioning trainer who can help set up a proper program for you and the last one which I recommend to some degree is what I call circuit training or any other training modalities and that includes Pilates, yoga, the speed bag and this is primarily to increase the, the, you know, the workload, overall work volume of the athlete, but also for some parts of the country, the weather is pretty nasty. And if you're scheduled to run uh, a track workout and you're snowed in three feet, well, just go inside and do some circuit training and then save the track workout for another day. And it's all flexible. You cannot control mother nature and as they say, life happens. So try to keep all these eight kinds of training in your repertoire. Okay, now all that stuff was fine and great. You're asking yourself, let's see how you apply it. Well, in this example, uh, I'm using a post-college athlete who is usually a private trainer or a teacher somewhere. In, in my example, my, my, my friends, and they're pretty free in the morning to do some serious work, and the weather is better in the morning as well. Now, if you have a college system, you'll probably want to switch the AM and PM sessions on this slide, but it, for this example, I'm keeping this for the, the post-college person. Now, you can see the Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday are the three track workouts and these are with the team you don't miss these three workouts unless you have like root canal surgery or some mysterious jury duty you have to attend to on a Saturday and the Tuesday the beginning of the week is usually best for speech sessions and that's why I use 200 or 400 meter sessions to get the athletes turnover going work on acceleration mechanics. Um, I even do 30s and 40s with my athletes when they train at 800s. And then Thursday is what I call the 1500 meter intervals where you're doing 
training for a miler. And then on Saturday is more specific with race paces or slightly faster than race pace for 800 meters. And then I throw in strength training twice a week on Monday morning and Friday morning. And Wednesday morning we do circuit training or yoga, whatever uh, you have offered in your area. Uh, the recovery runs are done in the evening in this case and I chose Monday, Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday so we have four days a week where we do recovery. The long run again it's Sunday it's the easiest day of the week where we show up really early so no one parties hard on Saturday night. They show up Sunday nice long run a bit of ab work and then call it quits go home have Sunday brunch with the family and the steady states are done on Wednesday and Friday. So it's a lot of work. It's 13 sessions a week uh, for in one week in this example. Now, if you're a master's athlete, this sample training week applies, but I would stretch that on a 10-day cycle. So instead of trying to squeeze 13 workouts in seven days, I would try to squeeze 12 or 13 workouts on a 10 day, maybe 12 day cycle and allowing more days for rest, recovery runs, massage, uh, any anything you can do to recover faster because that is the rate limiting step for masters athletes is trying to get the right intensity for the athlete and not blow up. Okay. I think by now I'm well over 12 minutes in the presentation. There's no way I can cover everything what I talked about in 15 minutes. So I'm going to give one suggestion. If you're really serious about running or training for the 800 meters, the best video I've seen is by Scott Christensen. And if you go to the website, I made a shortcut. It's speedendurance.com slash 800 and it's his website where he has about three hours of video all online and you can actually answer questions uh, it's like a blog membership style based and that's it for 800 meter training uh, it's a long video I thank you for staying this far if you're watching this and as always for more information visit speedendurance.com.